Tonight's presentation titled, Is It Legal to Install? Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's an author for numerous aviation publications, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, an A&P mechanic certificate with inspection authorization privileges, Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year in 2008, so honored by the FAA EAA member. Mike, thank you so much for continuing to be with us on these weekly webinars and uh, for your first week of the month. Already the month of May, what about that, huh? Hey, Mike, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, Tim, hi, everybody. Ooh, look at the count. We're getting close to having to shut the doors, aren't we, Tim? That's isn't that great? Uh, 920, uh, it'll go right up to 1,000, which is our go to webinar limit. Okay, let me see if I can get my slide up on the screen. You should see it now. A okay, Tim? It uh, looks great, Mike. Yep, looks great. Okay, super. Well, let's get started. Um, as Tim said, the um, uh, the title of tonight's talk is, Is It Legal to Install? I originally was going to call it Hot Seat for reasons that will quickly become apparent. Um, but we're going to be talking about, about what it is legal to install in a certificated aircraft. Because there's a lot of misconceptions about that. And uh, the idea for this webinar, as is often the case, came from a question that I got. Um, it actually wasn't from an aircraft owner, it was from a um, a renter pilot, a member of a flying club. And uh, he sent me an email, at, um, I'm quoting it here, he said, I'm a member of a flying club, and during the recent annual of our club Skyhawks, somebody got the bright idea to install automotive seat heaters in the plane without an STC or a Form 337. This seems like it might be a violation of the regulations, is it? Why would our club's A&P participate in the installation of uncertified equipment and then sign off the aircraft as airworthy? Should I question all the other work that the A&P performed? Should I report him to the local FISDO? So this, uh, this flying club owner was, uh, was pretty worked up over the fact that they had installed some automotive seat heaters in this Skyhawk. And, and basically the question is, is it legal? Um, now there's, there's a, a misconception that, that is widely held by uh, mechanics, by FAA inspectors. Uh, th there's this notion that if you have a certificated aircraft, um, the only equipment that you're allowed to install in that aircraft has to be FAA approved. Um, and obviously, if you put automotive seat heaters in the airplane, those are not FAA approved. So the question is, is it really true that, that, that the only kind of equipment you can install in a certificated aircraft legally is, is, a, is approved equipment? Um, you know, this came up quite a few years ago. Um, I wrote an article, I forget where I wrote it, but it, this was quite a long time ago, and it was not very long after I had, had gotten my IA. And it, it talked about installing something that was not, certi not uh, certificated equipment, not, not FAA-approved equipment in a certificate airplane. And I got a call from my um, the maintenance inspector at my local FISDO. Um, the, in fact, the guy that signed off my IA card. <laughs> and he said, he said, Mike, you can't write stuff like that. It's you can't leave people with the impression that it's legal to install and certificated equipment in a certificated airplane. And I decided I better research this. So I talked to the smartest people I could find in this area. I talked to a gentleman by the name of Rick Perry, who is the um, the, the uh, head of uh, technical services for uh, uh, the Aviation Electronics Association. And he's the guy that, that, 
that everybody turns to when you know that when they want to install a, a refrigerator in 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 their Gulf Stream and that sort of thing. So he knows about as much about installing. And I talked to another fellow by the name of Jason Dickstein, Dickstein who's a attorney um, for the Aviation Supplier Association, and has dealt with a lot of these issues on a legal basis. And um, as a result, I got some pretty good information about this, and, and I and I would like to to share it. But at any rate, let, let's let's just question the, the look at this question: Is must all equipment in a certificate airplane or aircraft be FAA approved? Well, here's some equipment that's installed in a certificated aircraft, or it's at least it's in a certificated aircraft. I, I, you know, I see a briefcase and a suitcase and some golf clubs. You ever put any of that stuff in your airplane? Is any of it FAA approved? Did you violate any regulations by loading that unapproved luggage into your airplane? Uh, not not sort of ex extreme, I'm trying to make a point here. Um, let's look at some other stuff. Anybody ever use an iPad in the airplane? I don't think that's FAA approved. And anybody ever use an iPad on a suction cup mount in their airplane? I, I do that on every flight. Uh, how about a portable GPS or a or, or a handheld uh, VHF transceiver? Um, none of those are FAA approved, um, but we use them in airplanes all the time. Are, are we are we violating any reg? So the the question is that by by bringing putting this non FAA approved stuff in an airplane whether it's luggage or an iPad or a handheld VHF transceiver, are we violating any FAA regulations? Well, I think everybody would pretty much agree that we aren't, but the question is, why is, is that okay? Why are we allowed to put this stuff that's clearly not FAA approved in our, in our airplanes? And the answer is, from a regulatory standpoint, that FAA certification only applies to four things, airframes, engines, propellers, and appliances, and also to parts of airframes, engines, propellers, and appliances. Um, what's an appliance? Well, appliance is the, is the FAA word for everything that isn't an airframe engine or propeller. <laughs> it's sort of a catch-all. And the definition of appliance is interesting. It, it, you'll find it in the definition section of the FARs, FAR 1.1, where all the definitions are. And the definition says this, appliance means any instrument, mechanism, equipment, part, apparatus, appurtenance, or accessory, oh, I love those words, including communications equipment that is used or intended to be used in operating or controlling an aircraft in flight, is installed in or attached to the aircraft and is not part of an airframe engine or propeller. So basically anything that is installed in or attached to the aircraft that isn't part of an airframe engine or propeller is considered an appliance. Now that leaves a question that the FARs don't address. And that is, what does this phrase installed in or attached to the aircraft mean? And that's not really written down any place. Um, I know of no regulation, no advisory circular, no FAA policy memo that, that says exactly what that phrase means, installed in or attached to the aircraft. But over the years, the, the FAA has adopted a, a a pretty consistent policy that says that for something to be installed in or attached to the aircraft it has to be fastened to the aircraft in some structural way it has to be glued screwed bolted or riveted to the aircraft so 
if if you put something in the aircraft but you don't attach it in a structural way to the aircraft then it's not considered installed in or attached to it's not considered an appliance and it doesn't have to be fa approved doesn't have to be certified in any way and the 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 interpretation that the FAA has always used, although it hasn't ever been written down in the regs anywhere, is that things like suction cups, Velcro, wing nut clamps, pretty much anything that is easily removable without using tools is generally not considered to be attached to or installed in the aircraft and therefore doesn't have to be certified. So, Armed with that information, let's take let's take a look at the seat heater issue because it gets kind of interesting. When th th this email that I got from from the flying club guy did not really specify exactly what kind of seat heaters that were put in the airplane, but a little googling revealed that there are two different kinds of aftermarket automotive seat heater heaters available. There are external seat heaters that sit on the seats and are attached with elastic straps. And then there are what I'm calling internal seat heaters, which are, are, are heating pads that are inserted between the upholstery and the foam padding. Um, and, and to install that in, in an aircraft seat, you have to do some disassembly of the seat and separate the the um, uh, the the material from the padding and and slip these heaters in there and then root the wiring and so on. So it it takes a little bit of work on the seats to 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 put these in. And once they're in position, they're they're um, they're they're secured with adhesive strips so that they won't move. So if you look at these two different kinds of seat heaters. Um, I, I would certainly say that the kind that sit on top of the seats and are uh, installed with elastic straps would not be considered to be installed equipment. They're, they're quickly removable without tools. You know, it's elastic is, you know, kind of like Velcro or suction cups. It, it, it really doesn't count as a structural mounting. And so if the kind of seat heaters that were involved with this particular Skyhawk were that kind, then I think clearly there's no there's no issue because it's not really installed in terms of the in terms of the way the FAA interprets that phrase. And if it's not installed, um, you know, in the same way that an iPad isn't installed or, or or the luggage you put in the baggage compartment isn't installed, then it doesn't it doesn't the FAA doesn't care about it. It doesn't have to be certified. The the other kind of seat heaters that you have to take the seats apart a little bit and, and slide them in between the upholstery and the foam and so on. I think any reasonable interpretation would be that that, that is installed because it'd be pretty hard to do without tools. It's not easily removable. <clears throat> so I, I think we would have to consider that, that second kind to be installed. Uh, so the issue of certification does come up with that, um, and so we will have to we'd have to look a little bit further. So so clearly the first kind is would be legal. The second kind we have to think about a little harder to decide whether that could be legal. So if it's installed and and it's an appliance meets the definition of appliance. Um, then the question is, was installing it a major alteration or a minor alteration? Because if it's a major alteration, then the regulations require that it be installed in accordance with approved data. And approved data is something that somebody in the FAA signed off on. So it can be an STC, it could be a field approval with the local FISDO or where the where local FAA guy signed off on it, but it has to have an FAA signature. Um, and um, 
uh, clearly from what the flying club uh, members said that, that there there wasn't any STC and there wasn't any, any field approval. So if it was a minor, a major alteration, we would have a problem. On the other hand, if it's a minor alteration, then it does not require approved data. It does not require the FA to sign off on anything. It only requires acceptable data, which means that it was installed in accordance to the all of the the the, the, the standard methods, techniques, and practices that that are required um, when we're working on aircraft. Um, The advisory circular AC 4313-1B uh, is where you usually look uh, to find the acceptable data for installing stuff. So we need to figure out whether this internal seat heater is a major or minor alteration to, to figure out whether it needs an STC or a field approval. Well, we go back to the FAR 1.1, again, the definitions, and the definition of a major alteration, uh, major alteration means uh, one that might appreciably affect weight and balance limits, structural strength, performance, power plant operation, flight characteristics, or other qualities affecting airworthiness, or is not done according to accepted practices or cannot be done by elementary operations. Accepted practices is what we were just talking about. The eight, AC 4313 1B, the big phone book size advisory circular that's the mechanics Bible, kind of tells you what accept, accepted practices are. And in addition to that definition, um, the, the FAA provides a list um, in part 43 appendix A, a list of uh, the kinds of alterations that the FAA considers to be major. It, it's not an exhaustive list, of course, but it's it's an exemplary list, and it 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 tries to um, help with the interpretation of that definition that we just looked at to try to figure to let mechanics figure out whether things are major or minor alterations. So, if you look at Part 43, Appendix A, if you look at the definition that we just looked at, nothing in the definition and nothing in the list seems to suggest that the seat heaters would be a major alteration. In fact, nothing anywhere in that list talks about seats or any sort of inter interior furnishings. It says, you know, if you work, if you, if, you, if you alter a wing spar, that's a major alteration. There's a long list of things, but, but nothing on the list talks about seats or, or other interior furnishings. So, Looking at the definition and looking at the at the list that, that, that tries to illuminate the definition a little bit, it, it seems pretty obvious to me, and, and every mechanic who does an installation has to make his own decision about this, but it seems pretty clear to me that there's nothing about installing one of those seat heaters that could possibly make it a major alteration. And so my interpretation is that it would be a minor alteration. So if it's a minor alteration, is it is it okay to do? Well, the, the, the question you then have to ask because minor alterations have to be done in accordance with acceptable data. So is the installation acceptable? And what does that mean exactly? Well, what it means is that the the equipment installed is acceptable if it meets all of the same regulatory requirements and, and achieves the same level of safety um, as the regulations under which the aircraft was certified in the first place. So in the case of the Skyhawk, which was a a, a very old design it was it was certified under the old car3 regs the seat heaters would have to meet all the requirements of car3 so that it, you know if cessna had installed them when they built the skyhawk originally 
they would have had to pass muster during the certification review. Um, so what would that require for a seat heater? Um, and again, they, there are different regulations depending on what kind of aircraft it's it's installed in. If it was going into a Cirrus, uh, that which is a Part 23 aircraft, then it would have to comply with Part 23. If it went into a Gulfstream, it would have to comply with Part 25. This is a Skyhawk; it has to comply with CAR3. So, what does that all mean? What 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 would you have to look at to figure out whether that seat heater passes muster? Well. Um, you'd, you'd have to determine if it constitutes any sort of a hazard. Does it meet the requirements for flammability and toxicity that, that, the, that the upholstery has to meet? Does it meet the all requirements for wiring and circuit protection and electrical load that any electrical thing has to meet in an aircraft like that? You'd have to establish that it doesn't in interfere with any of the other aircraft systems. and probably the only other kinds of aircraft systems it could possibly interfere with would, would be avionics or, you know, conceivably maybe it would, it would mess up the, 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 the wet compass if it, if it radiated a significant magnetic field. So all of that stuff would have to be checked by the mechanic to, to determine whether it's acceptable or not. Um, but if it is, and and it and it meets all the same requirements that were that that would apply to it if it had been part of the aircraft when it was originally certified, th then it's acceptable for installation as a minor alteration. It just requires a, a, a logbook entry by the mechanic. Now, to be honest with you, the, to, figuring out whether that internal seat heater does meet all the requirements of CAR3 is a fair amount of homework because there are quite a few regs you'd have to check. Um, and you might have to do it like a flammability <laughs> analysis of the seat heaters and stuff. And certainly not every A&P would be willing to, to take on that homework assignment to, to verify that the thing is acceptable. Um, but, but a mechanic who is is willing to to go through and and verify the various things and th th really the seat heater there aren't too many of the car three regs that would apply to the seat heater it it basically would have to you know meet the requirements of that upholstery has to meet and would have to meet the electrical requirements that any electrical thing would have to meet and it would have to not interfere with other things in the airplane it's 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 not that hard to to to, to verify but um, if, if a mechanic is willing to go through that exercise and satisfy himself that that, that this is acceptable uh, under the regulations that the aircraft was certified under, then it would be perfectly legal to put this thing in as a minor alteration with a simple logbook entry. Um, so that's kind of the way you analyze these things to figure out whether something is legal to install or not. Um, the first question is, is it, is it really installed? Is it attached in some structural way? If it isn't, you don't have to worry about it. If it is attached in some structural way, then does it meet the basic requirements of that the aircraft was certified under? And are, are we sure it doesn't constitute a major alteration? Because if it's a major alteration, then we have to have approved data. And that means something that the FAA has signed off on and clearly the FAA hasn't signed off on these seat heaters. So if it had been a major alteration, which and I can't see how how anybody could consider it a major alteration, but if it if it were, th then you'd need a field approval to put them in legally. Uh, but seat heaters, there's no way that that, that could be considered a major alteration. So, um, uh, so so the, the the issue of a, a field approval really doesn't come up. So going back to our our pilot, our, our uh, uh, flying club member, uh, what about his concerns? Because I, I I needed to answer this email, <laughs> and uh, I basically said, look, there's first of all, there's no reason to contact the FISDO. There's not really any evidence of a violation here. Um, but if the pilot is is genuinely concerned about the safety of this installation the appropriate thing for him to do is to bring it to the attention of the flying club's maintenance officer. And 
if the maintenance officer shares the, the pilot's concerns, then it would be perfectly appropriate for the maintenance officer to discuss the matter with the ANP. Um, and if they felt strongly enough that it that it, that it might constitute a hazard, uh, maybe they'd bring it up at a at, at a flying at a meeting of the flying club members or something. They could ask the A and P to remove it. Um, but there wasn't, you know, there isn't what I, there I, there was no information that would lead me to believe that a violation was committed in installing the seat heater. Um, and, and I said to the to the flying club member, I said, you know, reporting an A&P to the FISDO, it, it would be like calling 911 to complain that your neighbor is playing a stereo too loud, rather than calling the neighbor and asking the neighbor nicely to turn down the volume. Uh, you know, we calling the cops should be kind of the very, very last resort. Um, and, and it wouldn't, I think it would be very poor form to get the FISDO involved unless the membership was somehow convinced that the ANP um, did something that could get somebody hurt or killed and, and that less drastic remedies like asking him to take it out um, had been exhausted first. Uh, the, going to the FAA should be the very last resort. It certainly shouldn't be the, the first. I, and I was surprised that the, that the owner suggested that. At any rate, uh, th that's my little hot seat story, Tim. And um, uh, we can open it for Q&A. Uh, before we do, I just wanted to remind everybody, um, and I did uh, uh, last month, that um, during the during the, the duration of the COVID-19 lockdown, um, uh, certainly through the end of June, probably a little longer than that, um, my company has decided to open up its um, it's breakdown assistance program uh, that we normally charge $150 a year for and, 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 and make it free for anybody who, who wants to sign up for it. So um, we, we, I, I mentioned it last month, we got about 600 people who took advantage of it, but um, I would be delighted to see more aircraft owners take advantage of it, especially as things gradually start opening up and hopefully we start doing a little bit more flying. So if you're interested in that, you can go to SavvyBreakdown.com and uh, register for it for free. You just have to put your contact information and the information about your aircraft in there. And we don't ask for a credit card or anything. It's There's no strings attached. We're just doing this for the duration of the, of the, uh, of the COVID-19 crisis, however long that lasts. And with that, Tim, why don't we, uh, why don't we open it up for some questions? All right, Mike, uh, let's jump into them. Um, several people kind of wondering about this. Barry's question sums it up pretty good. What about the effect of the electrical load of the heaters on the electrical system? For example, uh, <clears throat> does it cause the system to exceed the capacity of the alternator generator? Doesn't that affect airworthiness? Absolutely, and and that was one of the items on my list. If 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 you noticed what the slide where I listed the various things that the mechanic would have to do as part of his homework assignment to determine whether the installation was acceptable. Uh, it was definitely an electrical load analysis to make sure that it didn't exceed the capacity of the electrical system, that it had proper wiring with proper gauge, with proper circuit protections, uh, circuit breaker presumably, um, and you know that would be something that would be required to install any electrical equipment, um, but particularly something like a seat heater, which probably draws you know a fair number of amps. Uh, you would definitely need to do a load analysis. That would be part of the 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 acceptability determination that the mechanic would have to make. Stuart's wondering, what about self-installing panel-mounted USB charging slots for powering iPads? Read that again. I, I think there was, would you read that again? I want sure. to get the exact word. Sure, out. yeah. It's uh, Stuart wondering, what about self-installing panel-mounted USB charging slots for powering iPads? Um, if the 
if 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 the phrase panel mounted means what I think it means, which is that it it it, it there, there's it's connected to the panel by some screws and stuff, then that's something that um, would require a, a mechanic to do. Um, it would not be something that an owner could do under his preventive maintenance authority. It, it's it's right on the borderline, but um, preventive maintenance does not include any authority to do alterations. Alterations are outside of the scope of preventive maintenance. Um, we, we can, as owners, we can do certain repairs um, under our preventive maintenance authority, um, but we're not allowed to do any alterations, and and that would be considered an alteration, albeit a minor alteration. Um, and again, you know, I've I've, I've heard tales of aircraft owners or direct complaints of aircraft owners who who, who wanted to get that well this is kind of the old days a second cigarette lighter socket installed in their airplane so that they could power a gps now we don't do cigarette lighter socket so much anymore we we do usb c connectors and stuff and was told by an avionic shop that 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 would be a major alteration and would require a a, a, a field approval well look Every installing mechanic has the obligation to to make that determination as to whether it's major or minor. But 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 calling the installation of a second cigarette lighter socket a major alteration to me is is absolute idiocy. I mean, I can't imagine anything more minor uh, th than doing something like that. And if if you look at what it says. Uh, in um, R43 Appendix A about uh, electrical system <clears throat> uh, alterations. Um, it says a major, a major electrical alteration system is, or, or major electrical system alteration is one that alters the basic design of the electrical system. Well, you know, I don't know how you would interpret that, but the way I interpret that is, you know, if you changed a generator to an alternator or you uh, you know did something like that that's a change to the basic design of the electrical system but 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 if you add one more circuit breaker to a circuit breaker panel and and use it to power some piece of electrical equipment that's not a major alteration to uh, that's not an alteration of the basic design of the electrical system the electrical system is designed to power lots of stuff through circuit breakers and you're just adding one more thing. So it is it's not a change of the basic design, it's just a, sm a small detail. So, you know, different mechanics interpret that definition of major alteration different ways. And, you know, I it, it's sort of sad for me to see that there's sort of a secular trend there where mechanics don't want to take responsibility for anything. So they s say that everything's a major alteration and they, they sort of kick it to the FAA to, to, to make the decision. Um, and I don't think that's particularly good for aircraft owners and there's no need for it. The vast majority of alterations are minor alterations. Only, only the exceptional ones, um, are, are, are major alterations and it, they really should be treated that way. Donald's wondering, what about replacing the cigarette lighter with a replacement USB port? Is that permitted? Well, of course it's permitted. Um, it's not, again, it's something that an A&P mechanic should do. It's not something that an owner should be able to do himself, technically. Um, but the mechanic can simply do it and 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 sign off a logbook entry because it's a the, a, a very minor alteration and it doesn't require approved data to do something like that. It only requires the use of acceptable methods, techniques, and practices, which is what any mechanic would do anyway. The, the, um, now, having said that, you know personally, I wouldn't I wouldn't 
get any heartburn if an aircraft owner did something like that. But if if the question is, is it legal? I have to say technically it's not legal because it's an alteration. And in theory, um, non-mechanic um, aircraft owners are, are, are not permitted to, to make alterations to their aircraft, even minor ones. Bart is wondering, what about a GPS mount that is screwed to the panel and also has the power and audio wired, hardwired to the audio panel? Well, again, that's that's a minor alteration, and it should be done by 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 or should be. When I say done, it doesn't have to be done by an A and P. It just needs to be signed off by an A and P. I mean, the, um, I, I probably use some of the wrong language there because you're allowed to do anything you want to to an aircraft as long as you have an A and P who's willing to inspect your work and sign it off. Um, you're just not. Um, you're not empowered to to approve it yourself if if it's an alteration. Alan is wondering: Is using an eight ply tire instead of the original six ply tire a major or minor issue? It's on a Belanca Super Viking. Uh, and I owned a Belanca Super Viking mm -hmm. too. Great airplane. Um, it's. Um, It, it it's not a, a a a major issue because the tires all meet the same TSO, but it's actually not a good idea to use um, a higher ply tire than what the what the book specifies um, because the higher ply tire is 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 stiffer and it doesn't deal with the the landing shocks as, as well so it's 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 not a great idea to to use a, a higher number of ply tires or to a higher ply rating tire than what the parts manual specifies um but but i i wouldn't say that it's a that that it constitutes an alteration i just think it's probably not not a great idea. Gary's wondering, may I install LED lights in the courtesy lights on my Cessna 172M? Um, that's a, that's a very borderline situation. The the uh, the um, prevent maintenance privilege for aircraft owners. It does um, give you fairly wide latitude to 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 do um, work on the internal uh, furnishings of the aircraft, things like upholstery and you know side panels and stuff like that. Um, changing the 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 light fixtures to LEDs. I guess it depends on how you do it. There, there are there are some cases where there's a an approved um, PMA replacement LED light that that goes into the same socket that the incandescent light came out of, and um, if it, it, and and I. Although it's sort of borderline, I wouldn't really have any problem with it with an owner making a replacement like that. Um, on the other hand, if you're if you're changing the if you're changing the whole fixture, um, that gets a little bit further over the line. These are th these lines are not black and white; they're a little fuzzy. <laughs> and um, I, I did a webinar a while back about preventive maintenance and the fact that it has long been taken as gospel that the 34 items listed in part 43 appendix a uh, as preventive maintenance items are the only ones that owners are allowed to do and then i brought up a an fa legal decision from from the office of general counsel rulemaking division came out about 10 years ago 
that said, no, that list is not exhaustive, it's exemplary, and you're allowed to do other similar things even if they're not on the list. So the, the, the line that bounds preventive maintenance, which is what owners are allowed to do without getting mechanics involved, is a bit fuzzy. And, and this FA interpretation that came out 10 years ago makes it quite a lot fuzzier which to me is a good thing because I'd like to see owners be able to do as much as possible without getting mechanics involved. Um, that's, that's sort of my bias here, but um, again, the preventive maintenance authority is not supposed to include authority to alter the aircraft. And so some of these things are such minor alterations that you sort of wonder whether you can squint real hard and say it's okay. It's they're just kind of that on the on the boundary line. Martha's question is then: What about an LED landing light? Um, there are actually two cases there. There there are LED landing lights that are STC. And there are LED landing lights that are that are PMA'd. The ones that are STC'd are, by definition, major alterations, um, and there's no question that a mechanic is required to make that alteration. Now, if that same STC landing light five years from now somehow got sick and it needed to be replaced with another like one, that's something that, a, that an owner can do himself because it's not an alteration. The, the airplane was already altered five years earlier by the mechanic and he did all the necessary paperwork. Uh, and what the owner is doing is simply replacing a part with a like part and, and replacement of landing light lamps is specifically itemized in the in the list of things that that owners are allowed to do is preventive maintenance but the first time that you converted the incandescent lamp to the led lamp that's the alteration and that's where the the mechanic has to be involved now if there was a if, if you if you were looking at a lamp that was a pma direct replacement for the incandescent lamp as opposed to an stc one the 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 PMA says this part is from the FA standpoint functionally equivalent. Uh, it's not an alteration. It's just a, an equivalent part to the one it replaces. In my judgment, that's one that that an owner could do himself because it doesn't cor it it doesn't uh, constitute an alteration, and uh, owners are explicitly allowed to change landing light bulbs. But if if it if it's an STC installation, then that requires a mechanic the first time you do it because that that alters the aircraft. Jeff's wondering how would you classify adding an LED light strip above the instrument panel? How would how would I classify it? Yes, I would classify it as a minor alteration. A very minor alteration. Okay, Chris is wondering, I have an iPad mount that has hex nuts on the mount. Is this considered installed and would changing to wing nuts make it not installed? Well, again, the, the, the question you're asking is one whose answer has never been written down by the FAA to the best of my knowledge but the general way that it has been interpreted is that if you can remove it without the use of tools um, then it wasn't considered to be installed um, again this is this is in the category of tribal knowledge as opposed to regulation. It, it's just not anything that the FAA has written down as an official policy anyplace. Um, but it, it certainly would, uh, if, if it installed with wing nuts, I don't think anybody could ever question it. If it installed with, if you need a nut driver to install it, somebody who was really, you know, 
picking nits. Maybe you, you, you ramp checked by an FA inspector who got up on the wrong side of the bed that morning or something. Uh, it, it could take exception to it and, and say, where's the paperwork for this? Um, probably would never happen. But again, we're, we're, we're talking about what, what my IT guy calls edge cases <laughs> that are right on the on the edge of, of, of boundary lines here. And that leads into Frank's question then, what happens if an AMP provides an install as minor, but at the next annual, the IA has a different opinion? Well, um, you know, that's, that, that's an issue. The, 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 um, It, it you know it's the installing mechanics decision to make uh, as to whether the installation is uh, constitutes a major or minor alteration, and in my judgment, the IA should not be second guessing that mechanic unless the mechanic did something so clearly out of the out of bounds that the IA feels he has no choice but to question it. Um, you know, under under those circumstances, the best thing to do would be to, if if it was possible, to get the IA to call the installing mechanic and have a conversation with him, and see if they can't get on the same page. Um, but again, the 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 line between major and minor alterations is not as as crisp as as you might want it to be. It the FAA has given a definition, which is pretty fuzzy, and then has given a list of things to illustrate uh, the kinds of things that it feels are are major. So if the alteration was something on that list, it, it's pretty clearly major. And, and if somebody um, declared it as minor, he goofed because that's the, that list is right in the regs. Um, on the other hand, if it's an if it's something that's not on the list, which means that the only guidance you have is is the is the FAR 1.1 definition, then you know different people could have different opinions as to whether uh, a particular alteration is major or minor. Um, because the definition it is a bit on the fuzzy side. Um, it uses, you know, words like appreciable and uh, other factors affecting airworthiness, you know, very open-ended phrases that, that, that allow for multiple interpretations by multiple reasonable people. Douglas is wondering, Rosin's sun visor has an STC. Does that mean that I as an IA must consider it a major alteration and must file the 337? Well, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Um, and, and I love that question. And it's one that, that has come up many times before. Um, the fact that the Rosen sun visors, I mean, look, that, that it's a wonderful example because if you just look at a Rosen sun visor and you look at the, the definition of major alteration, nobody in the world would consider the installation of a sun visor as a major alteration. You know, you remove two screws, take the old one out, put the Rosen one in and replace the two screws and you're done. Um, but Rosen, back a million years ago, um, managed to somehow convince some FAA guy to, to sign off an STC. Now, in my view, the FAA guy made a really bad mistake because he should have looked at it and he should have said, that's not a major alteration. Why are you applying for an STC? Because the, the guidance to uh, the airworthiness safety inspectors in 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 the in the ASI's handbook clearly states that if somebody applies for an STC and and the the, the inspector determines that it, that it's not a major alteration, he should refuse the STC application and say that's a minor alteration doesn't need an STC. 
So some somebody back a million years ago in the FAA made a mistake and they signed off an STC um, for the Rosen Sun Visors, which is really good for Rosen because it gives them all sorts of intellectual property protection on their sun visor design that they wouldn't have in the absence of the STC. Um, so now the question is fast forward to today, what 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 does an IA do? Well, 99% of all IAs would say, well, it's STC'd and therefore it's a major alteration. We have to install it in accordance with the STC instructions and we have to file a, a form 337 and send it to Oak City. Um, 1% of IAs, including the one that's sitting here talking to you right now, would say, well, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but you could also tear up the STC, take this sun visor and say, that's not a major alteration. So I'm going to install it according to AC 4313 and treat it as a minor alteration and, and sign off a logbook entry. I personally think that there's nothing wrong with that, except that the next IA who annuals that airplane and looks at the Rosen sun visors and who's in the 99% group is gonna say, where's the, ST, where, where's the paperwork for these Rosen sun visors? And because he, he knows that it's an STC product. And um, so it probably would be a disservice to the aircraft owner to install the Rosen sun visors without treating it as a major alteration simply because uh, that would be sort of setting him up for uh, for an argument at, at some subsequent annual inspection. Um, but I, I don't know of anything in the regulations that prohibits a mechanic from installing an STC item as a minor alteration and ignoring the STC. Um, it's just, you know, it, 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 it creates a situation that could be problematic for the aircraft owner uh, down the road. I don't think the IA could get in trouble for doing that. I think he'd have his press perfectly rational argument for doing it, but it, but it could put the aircraft owner in a difficult position at a, at a subsequent annual. Sean is wondering, do alterations <laughs> void manufacturer warranties? <laughs> um, it it depends. Um, the, for example, um, with Continental Motors, um, there there are lots of alterations to Continental engines um, that Continental does not consider voiding the warranty. I mean, for example, if if you had a Continental engine and you replace the cylinder and put a superior PM8 cylinder on there. Uh, and then subsequently the engine, you know, threw a rod through the side of the case and you made a warranty claim, uh, Continental wouldn't avoid it for that. But there are certain um, alterations to Continental engines that even though they've been approved by the FAA, Continental considers to, uh, to to avoid the warranty. And we we ran into that with some aftermarket um, turbo normalizing installations where um, somebody hangs a an approved uh, turbo normalizing system on, on, you know, in front of a, an engine that was designed to be normally aspirated. And it's fine with the FAA, but, uh, Continental basically says, if you put that on there, all bets are off as far as warranty is concerned. So it, 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 it's sort of a case by case situation. Ray is wondering, what about adding larger tires on a tail dragger? Um, well, there would have to be an approval basis for doing that, and often, often there is. Often there are STCs that that, that permit the use of Tundra tires and stuff. Um, but I don't think you can just do it. I, I think there has to be an there there has to be an approval basis for doing it. 
Richard is wondering, is removing seats an alteration? Um, well, yeah, it, th that's an interesting issue because, it, yes, it is an alteration, but um, one of the 34 items that are uh, included in the list of things that the FAA considers to be preventive maintenance is the, the removal and installation of seats. Um, now, that brings up an interesting question because if you remove, let's say you remove the last row of seats because you want a more baggage area, um, an aircraft owner who's not a mechanic is allowed to do that. The problem is that once he does that, he does not have a valid weight and balance. And um, aircraft owners do not have the authority to create new weight and balance documents for an aircraft. That has to be done by a mechanic. So an owner that that would like to be able to remove and replace seats on a regular basis, um, to, to be 100% legal, what he should do is go to his mechanic and and get the mechanic to provide him with two sets of weight and balance documents, one with the seats in and one with the seats out. And once he has those two sets of weight and balance documents, then the owner can remove and reinstall the seats anytime he, he chooses because that's explicitly allowed um, by uh, as preventive maintenance. Um, but you, you're supposed to have a valid weight and balance in the airplane. And so in that case, technically, you really would need two sets of weight and balance. And now again, people do this all the time. They very seldom go to the trouble of having two sets of weight and balances. Um, it's, it, it's, um, it's just one of these things that, you know, technically you're supposed to do it in real life. Most people don't bother. Richard's wondering, what about putting protective tape to the leading edges, specifically the horizontal stabilizer? Um, the, 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 to, to, to determine whether that's something that, that, that an owner is allowed to do on his own recognizance, you, you have to... You, you have to go through this mental exercise of determining whether or not the tape would have any appreciable effect on the aerodynamics or performance of the aircraft. Presumably you would conclude that it did not, in which case you can basically treat it as a protective coating like paint, which is something that owners are allowed to do on their own recognizance without getting a mechanic involved. On the other hand, if you if you put something on the leading edge that, you know, changed the shape of the leading edge in an appreciable way and, and could have a significant aerodynamic effect, then that goes beyond what what an owner is permitted to do. It would be an alteration and arguably a major alteration if 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 it had an appreciable effect on aerodynamics. So that, that's kind of the thought process you'd have to go through. And you would probably conclude that the tape, unless it's very unusually thick and elaborate and ribbed and or something, uh, that the tape would have no appreciable effect on aerodynamics and performance. And you would say, okay, then it's all right to do it. I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Joe's wondering if one area FISDO approves an installation using a Form 337. Should any FISDO approve the same Form 337 if submitted in another FISDO? Um, in practice, the answer is no. In fact, th there are some FISDOs that just don't like to do uh, uh, field approvals and basically are spring loaded to the no position. And there are other FISDOs that are very cooperative with doing field approvals. 
And one of the gripes that people have is, is the fact that uh, it, there's no homogeneity um, between one FISDO and another as far as their position on, on field approvals. Now, the FAA tried to rectify that some years ago by issuing um, some guidance and a thing called a job aid. And I, I think I did a webinar on all of this. It gets a little intricate. Um, it appears that what the FAA succeeded in doing with all that guidance is just making it harder to get field approvals, but it didn't really solve the problem of different FISDOs um, having different attitudes about, about field approvals. Um, I, I once had a, a, an interesting experience. Um, this was shortly after I got my IA and the ink was still wet on it. And I, I decided I wanted to install some LED post lights in my Cessna 310 to replace the incandescent post lights whose bulbs were always burning out. And I, deter and, I, and I determined that Whalen made these LED post lights that were just perfect for the job, but they weren't PMA approved. So I decided that this would be an excellent ex exercise for me to put together a, a request for a field approval. So I filled out a Form 337 with a whole bunch of supporting documentation that, that, that showed that it met all of, all of the acceptability requirements and stuff. And I trotted down to the, to the Van Nuys FISDO. This was back before 9-11 when you could actually trot down to the FISDO without having to make an appointment. And I ha proudly handed my, my package to the, to the maintenance inspector on duty and asked whether that he would look it over and grant me a, a field approval for my post lights. And he basically laughed me out of the place and said, nah, I'm, you know, we, we, we don't have time to deal with stuff like that. And I said, are you telling me I can't put these post lights in? And he said, no, I'm not telling you that. I'm telling you that I'm not about to, 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 to grant a field approval. And so I sort of walked off bewildered. And at the, at the next IA renewal, which was about a year and a half later, I sat down with the, 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 the airworthiness safety inspector who was going to sign off my IA card. And after he signed off my IA card, I told him the story about my post lights and the fact that I tried to do the right thing and I got laughed out of the place. And he said, uh, he shouldn't have done that. And he pulled out his stamp and he approved my field approval a year and a half later. So it's like anything else. It's the, the FAA is not a homogeneous entity. It is a collection of people, all of whom are different and uh, just kind of depends on which straw you draw on a particular day as to what they're going to do. Yeah, Dan's wondering, is it acceptable for an ANPIA to install a new transponder and then have an avionics shop test and calibrate? Absolutely. And... James is wondering, what about removing a panel-mounted instrument, transponder, radio from a tray for repair at a shop and then reinstall when repaired? Um, the, the removal of tray-mounted avionics is explicitly a preventive maintenance item that owners are allowed to do with the very peculiar exception that the transponders and DMEs, uh, pulse equipment, are are not supposed to be removed and reinstalled by a by an aircraft owner. I think that's a very very strange regulation, and I, I can't really understand the logic behind it. Uh, it's you know it's what, why would why is it okay to remove a you know, a, a GNS 530W from the panel, but not a KT-76. I don't know. I, that doesn't make any sense to me, but that's what, that's how the, the, the uh, PAR-43 uh, Appendix A list reads. Um, so panel-mounted avionics, which means stuff that comes out from the front as opposed to having to be pulled out from the back, 
Um, with the exception of pulse equipment, um, owners are allowed to remove it, take it to a radio shop for repair, and then slide it back in. Cyrus wonders, can we swap positions of two VOR heads on the panel? Navcoms stay where they are and continue to send the same heads as before. Um, that's kind of a gray area. It's it's not one of the things that's covered in the in the list of thirty four, and so it's it it's really not well-defined uh, as to whether an aircraft owner can do that without getting an A&P involved. The, the, the old traditional answer would be absolutely no, because the old answer was, if it's not on the list, you're not allowed to do it. The, the new answer uh, that's based on the FAA's, the FAA legal decision from 10 years ago, which says that list is exemplary, not exhaustive, um, it's it's it it now is sort of in the in the gray area it's it's you know it's i i don't think anybody would really consider that an alteration to to just to reposition some avionics on the panel um uh, so you could make an argument that it it's it it that it would be okay for an aircraft owner to do um i think you know, if you ask most people, they would say it's not okay because it's not on the list, but because most people don't really even know about the the, the FAA legal decision from 10 years ago that kind of modified that whole thing. Um, but it's it's sort of, it's, it's one of these gray area edge case things. Dennis is wondering, does mounting a GoPro mount using one of the inspection plates on a certain certificated aircraft wing, would that be legal or illegal? Um, you know, there's actually, I believe, an FAA advisory circular on that particular issue about mounting cameras, because there, there, there's so many questions that have come up about that. And, and I think it's fairly permissive um, about doing that sort of thing. They, the, you know, you have to, again, make a a determination that it's not going to have an appreciable aerodynamic effect. Um, but I, but my recollection of that, of of that advisory circle, which I don't have handy that from that I can look at, is, is that it's reasonably permissive about about mounting cameras on airplanes. Okay. Because every, every, everybody's doing it now. <laughs> Hal is wondering, do these same rules pertain to experimental aircraft? No. Experimental aircraft, it's the Wild West. You can pretty much do whatever you want to do. Only when it's a major change do you need to make an endorsement in your logbook certifying major change and then reflight test the aircraft in its phase one restrictions to prove that the major change is safe before you can go back into your normal phase two flight operations. So that is a, a distinction. And the definition of a major change is is essentially the same as the definition of a major alteration for certificated? Yes, it references that same regulation. It cites uh -huh. it in the operating limitations for the experimental aircraft. Got you. So a change in, in weight and balance limits and an appreciable change in, in, in performance, aerodynamics, stru structural strength, and other factors affecting airworthiness was, were the magic words, I think. Okay, uh, Frank is wondering, does redoing an electric, uh, does redoing an engine compartment baffling, does that require approved data? Um, actually, that is one of the things that is explicitly called out as being a major alteration, and an alteration to the to to the engine cooling system, which which a modification of baffles would constitute a change in the cooling system, is explicitly called out as a as a major alteration. 
Greg is wondering why are shoulder harnesses a major alteration? Um, well, I don't think they are. In fact, I think the uh, the FAA um, uh, put out some guidance on on shoulder harnesses to make it exceptionally easy to put those things in with, without having to get field approvals and so on, because they were very, very anxious for people to retrofit shoulder harnesses and aircraft. So I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure there's an advisory circular specifically on that issue of shoulder harnesses that, that goes out of its way to make it, to make it simple to, uh, uh, to put those things in. John wonders, if there's a question about legality, do you think an insurance company would or could possibly use an installation to refuse coverage or a damage claim? Um, no, that's actually, uh, that's actually a good question. And the answer to that question, which I actually have researched pretty closely, is um, the, the insurance companies don't... Um, that they they don't um ever get into the business of defining airworthiness if 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 the aircraft is considered airworthy by the FAA um which basically means that it 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 went through its most recent annual inspection and was signed off as airworthy and nothing has happened to it since then to to obviously make it unairworthy. Um, if, if the aircraft is is airworthy uh, by FAA standards, then the insurance company will always it'll always meet the requirements for for the insurance. And actually, some policies are written even even more permissive than that. For example, I know of Emco. Their policies actually only require that the aircraft be airworthy on the date that the policy goes into effect. And if the aircraft, for example, goes out of annual um, and, and you fly it and have an accident, um, Avenco will not deny coverage for that. Um, uh, whereas um, a lot of other insurance companies would deny coverage. David, or, or sim sim similarly, if you, were, if you were flying without a valid medical, um, Avenco, says if you're if, if you're legal and the aircraft is legal when the policy goes into force then you then you've got a year's worth of coverage no matter what happens um but other companies aren't quite as permissive as that <clears throat> david wonders what's an appreciable weight and balance change in regards to major alterations um well there's there's actually um a, an advisory circular about weight and balance that defines a negligible change, um, and it sort of depends on the on the weight of the aircraft. If it's a light aircraft, it's it's a change of one pound, or I don't know, a certain fraction of an inch in CG. It's it's actually it's actually well defined in the advisory circular, and for a larger aircraft that. It, it, a larger change is considered to be negligible. Um, they, they never actually try to define the word appreciable. That's one of those great um, mysteries as to what appreciable means. But uh, and it, it's also important to understand that um, it's not a change in weight and balance that 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 triggers major alteration. It's a change in weight and balance limits. Um, in other words, you know, if you if, if if you install a a five pound radio in that in your airplane, that doesn't make it a major alteration just because there's five more pounds. It's if you change the weight and balance envelope. Uh, le for example, let's say you put Fowler flaps or vortex generators or something, and decided that you had to change the the weight and balance limits that that is is a major alteration but just changing weight or balance without changing the the limits on weight and balance that does not constitute a major alteration because 
pretty much anything you do to an airplane is going to change the the weight and balance. Michael's wondering is adding <laughs> vortex. Oh, bless oh, you. Sorry. No, that bless you. Me. Is <laughs> I should have muted. <laughs> is adding vortex generators um, a major or minor change? Um, all of the VG installations I'm aware of are are STC and are treated as as major alterations. You you, you file a 337. Because the, a vortex generator is intended to appreciably affect uh, performance in aerodynamics. I mean, that's its purpose. The same thing with you know speed mods or anything like that. If if the purpose of it is to is intentionally to change the aerodynamics of the aircraft, then then by definition, it's a it's a major alteration. Missner is wondering, can an A&P install a major manufacturer, USA-made automotive belt for alternator? Um, well, it depends on on what the uh, what was specified in the parts manual. Because I mean, a lot of I've, I've seen a lot of aircraft. Uh, parts manuals where the belt was had had a like a Gates number on it or something, which is an automotive manufacturer. So it just depends on what the what the parts manual says. Robert's wondering. Mike, can I recover my Cessna 150 seats myself legally? Yes. Absolutely. Now you can you can buy um, a a, a pre-made interior kit that you can install yourself. Um, if you decide to reupholster your aircraft by just buying some bulk fabric and doing a bunch of cutting and sewing, you you do have the obligation to make sure that that fabric meets the, the flammability and toxicity requirements of, of, of the regulations. And you can either do that by buying fabric that is tagged as being FA approved, or you can buy whatever fabric you want and send a little swatch into a lab and have them test it for you and give you a certification that it meets Specs, but if if you're if you're doing reupholstery, the main thing you have to be concerned about is that the materials you use meet the certification requirements with regards to flammability and toxicity. Toxicity meaning if if there's a fire, does it does the stuff put off toxic fumes? We're sneaking up on the end here. Let's get a couple bit more uh, questions here. Michael's question, a lot of aircraft seats are supported on rails with removable hairpin type fasteners or a pin with a cotter pin. So are seats not certified? No, seats are certified. I mean, the part of the part of the certification regulations involve um, uh, specific you know, specifications that aircraft seats have to meet, and uh, um, if it's a Part 23 aircraft like a Cirrus, it, the the seats have to you know withstand 28 Gs and stuff like that. It's pretty they're, they're pretty uh, significant requirements for them. Matthew's wondering if you can give any recommendations for a non-permanent installation for a fire extinguisher, like an Cessna 182. Yeah, if you, I mean, if the, the fire extinguishers <clears throat> typically are installed with, um, with, with straps that, that are, you know, that are quick disconnect, you, you flip them and so on. Um, the the real issue is 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 mounting the fire extinguisher holder to something in the aircraft um and it depends on what you you mounted it to if you mounted it to um some interior thing that that you, that you're allowed to 
remove and replace uh, under your preventive maintenance authority, I, I think it probably would not be too much of a stretch to say that it was okay to do that. Um, if you mount it to something structural, if you, you know, if it's mounted to the wing spar carry through structure or something, then, then it becomes a problem. Last question, Michael uh, is wondering, can you speak to the legality of installing owner supplied or owner manufactured parts? Yeah, that's that's actually a very long subject and I think I did a whole webinar on it. Um, but uh, the, the short version is that the FAA does permit owner produced parts uh, on certificated aircraft and, and they, they have to do that because if they didn't, there are there are a lot of um, certificated aircraft that would never fly again. Those you know companies have long since gone out of business, and and for which parts are not available. And if you need to replace a rib or something, the only way you can do it is to manufacture one because there's no other, no other source. Um, so the FAA does permit owner produced parts. Um, the, it's an interesting, uh, it requires an interesting cooperation between the owner and the mechanic because, um, the mechanic does not have the authority to produce the part, but the owner does. The owner doesn't have the authority typically to install the part. Um, the, the, the requires the mechanic to do that. The mechanic, um, in order to install the part has to be satisfied that the part is airworthy. So the best way to to do owner produced parts, and I actually have some owner produced parts in my airplane uh, that that went in before I was an A and P, by the way, <laughs> um, is is for the part the 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 fabrication of the part to be a cooperative effort between the owner and the mechanic, so that if the mechanic is involved in the part the production of the part that the owner is actually responsible for. Um, then the mechanic will likely be satisfied that the part is okay to install and it would be willing to install it and sign it off. Um, but it's one of these things where the, the owner has the authority to produce the part, but it requires the mechanic to install the part and the mechanic isn't going to install the part unless he is persuaded that the part is, is airworthy. So it requires cooperation. Well, that's it, Mike. We had a wonderful Q&A session. I know that went on for a long time, and thanks, everybody. We had just great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get everybody's question asked. There's still a lot more questions, but uh, I know some of them were pretty tough for you, Mike, there. So I, I've, got, I've, I've got a very serious throat tickle. Next time we do this, i got to bring a glass of water with me to the into into my office because <laughs> yeah well you're struggling it's, here yeah. this, this was it was a really good really good questions though it really was great questions um looks uh well we maxed out there was a thousand people logged in at one yep. point in time we we maxed out so uh thank you all so much for joining us mike take a moment and uh, share closing thoughts with everybody okay i'll be really quick because we've been we've been at it for a while here um but the the usual stuff um uh if you're not on my newsletter list sign up for it uh it's a monthly newsletter uh, that we send out by email and you can do that on the savvyaviation.com website or you can do it on the on the on the survey that uh that Tim is going to put up at the end of this webinar um my four books are available on Amazon um and I would appreciate it if those of you who have bought the books and read them would would go post some reviews uh, that would be that would be very helpful to post reviews on amazon um i did want to mention that i have started a new project and that is to turn these four books into audiobooks um because a lot of people nowadays um prefer to listen than to read and i'm one of those i'm a, i'm an audiobook addict and i always have an audiobook on my iphone and i'm listening to it constantly so i'm do putting i'm doing audiobooks i'm working on manifesto right now and i should have that done within about a month and up on audible and then the other three books are monsters are 500 plus pages each so that'll take a while but 
I am doing that. And if you are interested in supporting uh, this effort, I would appreciate it if you would go to my Patreon page uh, and become a patron, uh, patreon.com Savvy Aviator. Uh, let's see, upcoming webinars. Um, June, predictive maintenance, interesting stuff. Um, we're, there's, there's a new trend in maintenance um, that, that's highly data-driven. Um, it's, it's been pioneered by the airlines, but we're starting to do it in GA, um, where we have lots of sensors in the aircraft and we crunch the data and put it through algorithms and try to figure out um, when um, uh, failures are likely to occur so that we can uh, base maintenance on that rather than on invasive inspection. So I'm going to talk about that in, on the, in the June webinar, both what's been going on in the airlines industry now for about 15 years and what we're starting to do in, in GA in this area. It's kind of interesting. Um, July webinar, Justice Denied, um, will be uh, a dissecting a, uh, a, a fatal aircraft accident um, th that was uh, investigated by the NTSB and then uh, was subject to extensive litigation. And uh, I, I was involved in the litigation and I will tell you what really happened and it's really not what the jury determined and it's not what the NTSB determined. So it's, an, it's just an interesting, interesting case of, of how these things unfold in terms of uh, um, accident investigation and probable cause determination stuff. And then uh, in August, uh, I'm going to be talking about why valves stick, and um, it's uh, th there's a lot of conventional wisdom about sticking valves, and most of it is wrong. And I'm going to get into the chemistry and physics of why valves stick, and talk about what we can do to prevent them from sticking. This is more of a problem with Lycomings and Continentals, and you'll understand uh, why that is, and what we what what we is as operators of these engines can do about it. And uh, just once again, um, if, you're, if you're interested in signing up for our free breakdown assistance program, it's uh, like AAA for GA, it's a 24 seven hotline. We normally charge $150 a year for it, but we're doing it for free during the duration of the, of the, of the COVID crisis. And um, if you're interested in signing up for it, uh, you can go to SavvyBreakdown.com and we'll ask you to, to, to open up a free account, give your contact information, your aircraft information, and that's it. You don't have to enter a credit card or anything like that. It's free and there's no strings attached. And that's what we're trying to do to help keep the fleet flying during this very difficult time. And that is all I have. Thank you so much, Mike. On behalf of uh, everybody who attends webinars, I want to thank you for volunteering and sharing your information as you do each and every month for over all these years with us. Uh, so enlightening, so helpful, um, such a great service to our general aviation community. Thank you, Mike. My pleasure, Tim. To everybody who tuned I'm, in. I'm just, I'm just delighted to see, see us filling up the rooms like this. It's just great. Well, it is great, but I hope we can soon get back out and get on with our real lives, you know. That's true. Anyway, That's I'm true. looking at a wonderful full moon out here in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. A beautiful moon out there tonight. Big and bold and crisp edges. Uh, wow. Mm. I'm going to have to sit outside for a little while and just enjoy yeah. the moonlight out there. Everybody I'm about tuned... an hour from sunset here. so. Yeah, everybody who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you can tune in tomorrow night. Have a great night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming.